very much, everybody. That's really nice. Thank you. We love, we love you. Thank you very much. What a group standing right next to me. I'm honored to have you all with me. Ben, I've only known you. I don't want to say how long. It's too long. But you have done some job. The whole — I'm very proud to be with the five gentlemen up here, very special. And we have a lot of special ladies and gentlemen in the audience that are my friends, and they have been for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight with Crooked Joe Biden's absolutely worst nightmare. Hundreds of proud, black, conservative American patriots. The worst nightmare. Together, we're part of the greatest political movement in the history of our country. It is the greatest movement, I think, without question, in the history of our country. And it's uh, done great things. And then we had a little interruption. But uh, the interruption is not going to last much longer. And we're going to have a tremendous victory. It's going to be even, I believe, greater and probably more important even than in 2016. That was now number one, but I think this is going to be something very, very special. Over the past eight years, we've energized the Republican Party, and we've expanded the Republican Party. You and I have made it bigger, better, and so much more interesting than ever before, and much more important than ever before. In 2020, we increased our share of black vote by 50 percent, 5-0. And we earned more votes from African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans than any Republican in generations. This hasn't been — you go back many, many decades, and uh, we're really honored by it. We're on track now to smash. You see what's happening. The polling's coming out, and they go, wait a minute, there must be a mistake here. They're saying, black people really like Trump. There must be a mistake. These guys know it's no mistake. They're saying, what's going on? We had one today, 28 percent. We had one at 31 percent. And, you know, I hate to say, when uh, I looked at Romney, does anybody know Romney? Didn't he get 4 percent? He got 4 percent and falling. And uh, we're, we're at a number that people are — frankly, if we were 28 percent, I don't even think we have to do the election. <laughs> they would just — I think they just — wouldn't they just sort of leave — they would leave. They'd just say, let's get out of town. Well, the getting is good because we're going to do great things for everybody, for all Americans. As one sign of just how great a job we've done, there are more black Republicans serving in the U.S. House of Representatives today than at any time since the 1870s. That's a long time ago. To me, that's a sign of progress. But the radical left Democrats in a cause, and it's a uh, — it's a cause for panic for them. It's a nightmare, hysteria, and rampant outbreaks. They're suffering from a terminal case of Trump derangement syndrome. Have you all heard? They have Trump derangement. They are really not doing well. But, and they shouldn't be doing well, because honestly, they've done a lousy job for you. They've done a lousy job for you. They've been, done a lousy job for everybody. But for black Americans, they have done a very poor job. Every day, we are welcoming more black voters back home to the Republican Party. You remember the party of Lincoln, party of Lincoln, to help us reclaim the party of Frederick Douglass, party of Abraham Lincoln and other great people. We're delighted to have some of our party's most prominent leaders with us tonight, and they are really incredible leaders with incredible futures. And some of them, like Byron Donalds, is so young. Wesley Hunt is so young. You guys are so young. Oh, I'd like to get a couple of years from them. <laughs> they're young, and they're brilliant, and they have an incredible, incredible future. They really do. I think they have an incredible future. Senator Tim Scott, he gave me his endorsement. He's been one of the best people we've ever had uh, involved with us. He's been unbelievable. He's a dynamo. And uh, he uh, — I heard what he said to you. He gave a speech today at Rock Hill. He tore the house down. He's better for me than he is for himself. You know that? <laughs> right? You know why? He's a good person. I don't mind speaking about myself. He doesn't like speaking about himself. <laughs> he likes speaking about people that he thinks can do a great job. He's a special — where is Tim, by the way? Is he around here someplace? Because 
He was just back there. Uh, he is a very, very special guy. And another special man is Secretary Ben Carson. And, you know, we were running. Can I tell him our little, uh, little statement that you made to me in a church one day? Actually, you made it twice. You made it in a church and you made it just before a debate. But we're running. And he was doing very well, by the way. He was, he was knocking them dead. Everyone loved him. He was uh, tremendous religious support, evangelical support in particular. And he was going up, up, up. And I was up there. I came out and we would, I was doing really well. And I started to get a little bit nervous about Ben. He was going up a little too fast. I was not. Him. <laughs> and he said to me, you have nothing to worry about. God put you in this position. You're going to win. We, I was running against him. He's the most competitive guy. But he said, you're going to win. God put you in this position. And I, I was confused because I'm ready to go into a debate stage. And he's doing so good. And he made that statement. And I always remembered that. And then he made a similar statement at the church. And uh, he's been a great friend of mine. He did a great job. No scandal. Remember, he was at HUD. Everybody at HUD has scandal. You know, they get a little money for an apartment house approval someplace. No scandal whatsoever. HUD, you go check out HUD. Housing, urban development, you check it out. There's been a lot of problems over the years. There was nothing. He just ran a great operation with some very good people you had. You were right about all those people. and They were great. Thank you, Ben, very much. We appreciate the job you've done. And thanks also to Black Conservative Federation founders, Deontay Johnson and Quinton Jordan. Fantastic people. Congressman Joe Wilson, you know, famous for uh, a remark he made years ago. Nobody will ever forget it. And we love this guy. He's a, he loves our country. A woman that I've known for a long time. I refuse to say how long, but I've known her for a long time. And uh, she's uh, really incredible. And she was, she was very advanced. I mean, she understood what was happening long before most of the people in the room really did. Alveda King. Where is Alveda? Where is she? Thank you, Alveda. You really were. You know, you were a pioneer in the Republican Party, so to speak. She understood what was going on. Vice Chair of the California GOP, Corin Rankin. Thank you very much, Corin. Thank you very much. Great job. She's another one going places. A lot of people are going places in this room. Vice Chair of the Maryland GOP, Nicole Bennett. Thanks, Nicole. Great job you're doing, too. A friend of mine, somewhat controversial, but smart as hell, Vernon Jones. Where's Vernon? He's not even... Are you controversial, Vernon? No. Scott Turner. He did a fantastic job in the administration. Scott. Jack Brewer. These are great names that have done incredible work. Duke Tanner. Thank you, Duke. And I granted uh, clemency, a pardon, to Duke, and uh, he's gone on to do fantastic things. It's, it's interesting. I can endorse a person, and sometimes they're grateful and sometimes they're not. I mean, I you know, endorsed a few people that you probably read about. They weren't so grateful, were they, huh? What do you think? And not too much. They weren't too uh, grateful to me, right? And uh, they said, uh, will you run against the president? And he said, I have no comment. That wasn't good. That meant yes. But I did. I endorsed uh, a few people that weren't very grateful. But the one thing, when I gave pardons to people, every single person, I mean, I've never seen so — when they see me, they cry. It's such an incredible power of the president. And people that I felt were unfairly convicted of something, or maybe it was too long. We had a woman, a wonderful woman. We all know who that is. I won't even mention names. She was given 50 years in jail, 50. She served 22, 23. And uh, she had like 25 years left. I said, for what? And today it would be, they wouldn't, you know, it would be a reprimand what she did. And it's, it was so sad to see that. I let her out. I let a lot of people out, a lot of, lot of great people. But I've never had anybody that — I've never had anybody with a pardon. The endorsements, mostly good, but, you know, 10 percent of them just, just really are not very appreciative. 
I wish I had them to do again. I would never give them. I would never give them. I would never give them, I'll tell you that much right now. The hell with those people. But when I pardon somebody, I've never had anybody get out and say, oh, I don't like him. I never liked him. I'd like to run against him. I'd like to do. They always, they see me and they literally start to cry. People with records and people that had some big problems. And they're cleaner than anybody else in the room. You know, when you give a pardon, they're expunged of everything. They're the cleanest people. I often say, this guy who had a rough life is cleaner than anybody else in the room. All dilettantes, right? They say the cleanest. But it's something that I really appreciate. So uh, we appreciate some of the people that I gave pardons to are in this room. And we all know who you are. Or we, I know who you are. And uh, it was my honor. It was my honor. A man who I really like, and he's a hell of a pastor, I can tell you that. Pastor Mark Burns. Mark, where are you? Where's Mark Burns? He's... He's a great guy. Good. These lights are so bright in my eyes that I can't see too many people out there. But uh, I can only see the black ones. I can't see any white ones, you see? That's how far I've come. That's how far I've come. That's a long, that's a long way, isn't it? These eyes. <laughs> Uh, we've come a long way together. Lynn Patton. She's been incredible. Lynn Patton. And tonight's honorees, so deserving, Mary Milben and C.J. Pearson. So, Mary and C.J., congratulations. That's unbelievable. With the help of many of you in this room, we are going to win the South Carolina primary tomorrow night. Hey, this is exciting. Stick around. We'll all get together, okay? And this November, we're going to defeat crooked Joe Biden. He's a crooked, corrupt, horribly incompetent president who's destroying our country. Other than that, I think he's quite a nice man. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. Uh, I was talking uh, this day. We had a big rally. We had a really we had we could have filled that arena. It's a 8000 seat arena. We could have filled that thing three times. And uh, I said to the people, I didn't say this often. But I said, look, here's a story. I always respected the office of the president and the presidency so much. And I would never hit Biden very hard. But then he indicted me. <laughs> he indicted me. I said, I can't believe it. I got indicted. I got impeached and we won them, thanks to these couple of guys back here. But I got impeached. And Ben was helpful, too, I will tell you. But I got impeached. I, that was a terrible thing. Should never happen. And it turned out I was right in the impeachment. The phone call turned out to be exactly right. They found the laptop from hell. It confirmed everything that I said. They actually go around now saying, you know, we shouldn't have impeached that guy. He was absolutely right. But we beat him twice. But I got indicted for nothing, for something that is nothing. They were doing it because it's election interference. And then I got indicted a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. It's, it's been pretty amazing. But it possibly, I don't know, maybe there's something there. But I got also sued, and a lot of it comes right out. All of it comes out of the Justice Department, or it comes out of the Democrat Party. And it's a disgrace. This is like a third world country. And I say often, Alphonse Capone, I don't know if you know who Alphonse Capone is. This was the roughest, meanest gangster in history. I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, Scarface. <laughs> if he had dinner with you and if he didn't like the tone of your voice, he would kill you that night. You would never see your family again. You were dead. I got indicted. My parents are looking down, say, how the hell did this happen to my son? I never heard the word practically. But we're going to do something that's great for our country. We're going to make America great again for everybody, but we're going to make America great again also. And I'm not sure I can say necessarily again in this case for African Americans. We're going to make America great for all of our country, but for African Americans. And maybe, maybe we have to leave the word again out. You understand what I mean? Because Maybe there is no again. We're going to make it great for you and great for everybody. And that's important. Our country has gone through hell. And in many cases, our country is in hell right now. And we're going to turn it around. We're going to turn it around fast for everybody. 
and I think you're going to be very happy. A big start tomorrow. We won, as you know, Iowa in a landslide. We won it by twice the record. We had the biggest margin ever times two. That's not bad. We, we did a number nobody thought. And in all cases, it's been higher than our expectations or anybody's expectations. We went to, as you know, New Hampshire, and we got more votes than anybody in the history of the New Hampshire primary. Then, then we went to Virgin Islands and Nevada. In Virgin Islands, we won all of the delegates. In Nevada, we only got 99.7 percent. We won. So that's four. And I heard Nikki today. Nikki, Nikki, wonderful. I will never run against our president. He was a great president. Don't forget, she worked for me. But a lot of people don't realize I actually moved to there because I wanted to get Henry the governorship, if you want to know the truth. That was very important. And he's been a great, he's been a great governor. And Peggy, they've been a great couple. But that was a big — actually, it was a big factor. I said, well, if I move her over, she'll probably be okay, but we'll get a great governor for a state that I love. I've always won here. I won the primaries, and I won the elections. We, we never had a loss here, Ben, right? We never had a loss. But uh, uh, — so, Nikki, we're going to see how that all turns out. But we have a big deal tomorrow, and it's so important that everybody get out and vote because we want to win by big margins, because the big day is November 5th. And we have to send a signal that we're coming. We have to send a signal. Our message to the black community in this election will be a very simple one. If you want strong borders, safe neighborhoods, rising wages, good jobs, great education, and the return of the American dream, then congratulations, you are a Republican. It's pretty simple. Joe Biden and the radical left have abandoned everything black Americans care about. They've, uh, they've really let you down. Look, we all understand it. They've thrown black Americans overboard, and it's been uh, not a pretty thing to watch. You take a look at some of these inner cities. But I and the Republican Party will fight for the black community like you have never had anybody fight for you before. And with me, you will never be taken for granted. You will never be taken for granted. They've taken you for granted. Do you ever notice they always come around about two months before an election? Then they get your votes, and then they go on, and, you know, you, four years later, they come and say hello, or two years, depending on what office we're talking about. But they come back, and they uh, do nothing. They do absolutely nothing until it's election time. Then they come in. They, they uh, seek your vote. The future we want is one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And that's what we're doing, and that's what we're going to have. And Joe Biden is actually — his incompetence, perhaps. But Joe Biden is a threat to democracy, a real threat to democracy. They're trying to turn that around. They're trying to say, Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. No, no. When they do weaponization and when they do election interference like a third world country, they're really a threat to democracy. Under my administration, black Americans prospered like no time in the history of our country. We achieved the lowest African-American unemployment rate ever recorded. That's a big stat. That's like, you know, Babe Ruth hit the most home runs or Barry Bonds. I don't know. Who the hell is it? What are we giving Barry Bonds? Barry Bonds. Huh? It is, I'd see. You know, I know they put an asterisk. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But there's something awfully nice. How many home runs did he hit, you know? Do we give it do we give it to Barry Bonds? Tell me. Do we give it to Barry Bonds or Babe Ruth? Okay, I'm okay with that. Huh? Barry? Okay, I'm with I'm with Barry, hey. Especially tonight, I'm with Barry. I'm with Barry. In front of another group, I may be with the babe, but I, I don't. But we also set record low unemployment rate among black young people. It was a record it ever. It was never anything like it. Before the China virus, you don't mind if I call it that. We want to be, we want to be accurate, you know. It came out of China. It came out of China, right? 1.2 million African Americans lifted themselves out of poverty on the strength of the Trump economy, the most in more than a century. Think of it. It's never happened like that before. Black Americans saw their largest increase in home ownership ever recorded. These are things that happened during this four-year period, Wesley, right? All of it. 
Uh, the black labor force participation rate reached its highest point in a generation with Senator Scott, Tim Scott, came to my office. I'll never forget it. I have an idea, he said. We created opportunity zones, which drove billions and billions of dollars in wealth to revitalize our most distressed communities, especially in the inner cities. I think it's the greatest economic development program maybe ever, and people don't talk about it. But that was done by Tim Scott, and then he came to see me, and we got it done, and it's been incredible. I got record funding for historically black colleges and universities. You know, the first year I saw like 45 guys come up. They're the heads of most, I think, guys, one wonderful woman, actually. They were the heads of the colleges. And I said, so what are you doing? They said, we come up every year to ask for help, funding. And I said, all right. I didn't think much about it, but I got it for them. The second year, they came up, and I said, what are you doing here? Well, we're back again. I said, you have to do this every year? They said, yeah, every year we come up. We never have funding, so we always come up and ask for funding. And one of them said, I feel like a beggar. I come up, I feel like a beggar. We do a good job with those incredible schools, but I feel like a beggar coming up. I said, ooh, that's tough. And sort of then forgot about it, as we did. You know, I was focused on Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, and lots of other things, right? That we won, we won. There was no collusion. I could have told them that in, in the first minute, Ben. But the third year they came up, I said, okay, you're here to get money again, aren't you? Yeah, well, that's right. And they'd come over to the White House, and I got to know them a little bit, and they were fantastic. I, I tell you, in particular, like, I had some guys in there that were phenomenal people. And I said, you're looking for money again? I said, I have an idea. Why don't we get you a 10-year plan where you have all the money you want? Give me a number, and I'm going to add some more on to it. And I'll get it approved. And I got it approved. And we took care of these incredible people. And I said, the only bad thing is that I like you guys. I may never see you again. It was very sad, actually. I said goodbye to them. And actually, I've never seen them again. They don't need me anymore. But Ben knows this. You remember that period of time. It wasn't that easy to get, either. And I think a lot of the politicians in Washington use that as a lever to take advantage. In other words, every year they'd have to come up, and what are you going to give me now? They don't have to, <laughs> they don't have to kiss anybody's ass anymore, I can tell you that. <laughs> so we took care of that. A lot of people don't know that. Everybody on stage knows it. And we'll invest more in a second term. We're going to take care of them. And uh, they, they really have. They've done a great job, and it's very tough. You're competing against schools that have billions and billions of dollars in endowments. And it's a tough, it's a tough deal, but they've done an incredible job. Under crooked Joe Biden, it's been nothing but cat — it's really a catastrophe and a disaster. And you know it better. And I'm not saying this, and this is not — this is from the heart. It's been a disaster for black Americans. Biden gave you a three-year inflation rate of almost 39 percent. So over three years, didn't matter if you made a little bit more money. After inflation, you were way, way behind. The number of African-American families living in poverty has increased by more than 50 percent since the year one of his administration. Hard to say that his administration, because, you know, we got more votes than anybody in the history of a sitting president. We got millions more votes than we did in 2016. I was told by John McLaughlin and Fabrizio, the great pollsters, sir, if you can get 63 million votes, that's what we got in 16. There's no way you can be beaten. Well, we got like 75 million votes. I said, so I guess we didn't get beaten, yeah? But they said we got beaten. Now, we're going to be watching very closely. Look, we have, we have a country, we have a country that's got a lot of things going on. We have an open border. We have bad elections. We have very, very bad elections. You have to have honest elections and strong borders, or you don't have a country. You don't have a country. The average mortgage payment is now almost two times as high, costing the typical family an extra $19,000 a year in mortgage payments from when I was president. You and your family cannot afford four more years of Bidenomics. He thinks it's a good term. It's a really bad term. Anything having to do with his name is bad. That's why this November, black Americans are going to tell — you all watch The Apprentice, right? They're going to tell Crooked Joe Biden 
You're fired. You're fired. Get the hell out of here, you You're fired. Get out of here. You've been an incompetent, horrible president. You allowed wars to go that should have never happened. Israel should have never been attacked. Ukraine should have never been attacked. You're a lousy president, worst president ever. The happiest person about him, though, and man who thinks very warmly of him, is Jimmy Carter, because Jimmy Carter is now considered a brilliant president by comparison to crooked Joe Biden. Jimmy Carter is a happy man. For Biden, wrecking the dreams of African Americans is nothing new. You know this. You know the real story behind this guy. I said, do I really want to say this stuff? Then I said, what the hell? I've been saying it. You know, when they said, oh, you can't run. You know, when you look at the presidency, it's such a cherished, incredible position, such responsibility. But 92% of the people were politicians and 8% were generals. So no percent were from where I came from. So they said, oh, he's just going to have a good time. You think I'm having a good time? I'm not sure it's a good time, but I love it. That's love it because we're going to make America great again. That's why I love it. But I said, do we really want to hit him that hard? Because if you do, you can really go back into history with him. It's the only thing he's really been good at his entire career. You know what that is? Being a racist because he's a racist. Crooked Joe backed NAFTA, which is a disaster for just a disaster. It's been a disaster for Hispanic Americans and for black Americans. China's entry into the World Trade Organization, where they just ripped us apart. I took in $472 billion from China. No other president has taken in anything. They did not want to see me do so well. You know, we're leading in every poll by a lot, you see it. And I don't think China's too happy about that, actually. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and every other globalist horror show that ripped the guts out of our country and pulverized black workers and owners of small businesses. So to any black voter who's thinking of casting your ballot for us uh, for the first time, it might be for the first time, and probably is, it's amazing. What's happened in the last two years is actually amazing. And it's been based on results, real results. Just remember, you owe Crooked Joe Biden, absolutely nothing. You don't owe him a thing, so do not feel guilty. Please do not feel guilty. The radical Democrat Party has waged war on black families for many, many decades. Think of it. It's really a hundred years. It's a century. They've controlled these cities for a hundred years. Hard to believe. I said, can't be. It is. They've controlled. And look at what you take a look at Baltimore. You take a look at New York, you take a look at Chicago, you take a look at all of these places, take a look at what's going on in the West Coast, take a look at what's happening. And they've controlled these cities for a hundred years. And nothing happens. Uh, they're slum areas, they're dangerous. Nothing has, nothing has happened. And we're going to change it. We're going to change it. Thank you. I like that guy. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a voice. I love that guy. Who the hell is that? Is he a friend of yours? <laughs> yes. We're going to send him to the Met. So come join us in the Republican Party and never, ever look back. We're doing no, we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right. On top of everything else, Joe Biden really has proven to be a very nasty and vicious racist. He's been a racist. Whether you like it or don't like it, I happen not to like it. Most of the people in this room happen to not like it. And if somebody does like it, they're not supposed to be here. <laughs> Biden spent years palling around with notorious segregationists. You know that. He boasted that his home state was a slave state. He was very proud of that. He thought it was great. If you go back and look at his body language and the way he said it. He was very proud of it. He said that he didn't want his children to grow up in a, quote, racial jungle. I don't want my children in a racial jungle. Joe Biden drafted the 1994 crime bill, which caused unfair sentencing disparities that devastated the black community, black families. Cory Booker 
called Biden the architect of mass incarceration. Remember this. It was a time when Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden were talking about predators and super predators. You heard that. This is a hell of a lot more of a speech than you thought you were going to get, isn't it, huh? <laughs> they thought it would be boring them, would make, uh, would give a little quick boring speech, but uh, we got it. It's called, let's tell it like it is, right? <laughs> and then years later, Thank you very much. I just want to tell the truth. Remember, remember Howard Cosell? I just tell it like it is. It ended up getting him fired, but these are my. And then years later, in an act of stolen valor, Crooked Joe had the nerve to falsely portray himself as a hero of the civil rights movement, which was such, which was so false. And then he said that if African Americans didn't vote for him, you ain't black. Now that one, that one, you know, that one, that one's been so recent, I didn't even want to, but he did say that. A lot of people were surprised. He did say that. But that one's so recent, I didn't even want to put it in. We had to go back to the real stuff. But he did say that. I was a little surprised to see it. I'm sure you were, too. Unlike racist Joe Biden, I've spent my entire life working hand-in-hand -hand with black Americans to create jobs, build buildings, invest in our communities, and expand opportunity and freedom for citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed. And we have. I built a lot of buildings. And I want to tell you, a black worker is a great worker. You've done an incredible job. They've done an incredible job. Really talented, great people. And that goes for others, too. Hispanic is incredible. You know, the Hispanic numbers are, been, you know, they're through the roof. In Miami, we're leading in Florida with Hispanic. Along the Texas, they call it the, uh, the corridor, but they it's, it's the line going between Mexico and Texas for a long way. We want every single community along the, uh, they call it the special line. We want every single community, and mostly, I think it's 88% Hispanic. It was a fantastic thing. Something that I'm so proud of. And it is really changing the Republican Party. The Republican Party has been a much bigger party. It's a much bigger, more inclusive party, and that's a fantastic thing. Yeah, no, it's it's just, it's a fantastic, I'm very proud of it. Here's my promise to you as your president, I will go to work for you every single day. I will not quit until the American dream is alive and thriving for you and for every citizen in our land. And we put America first. You don't mind that. We put America first. Everywhere Joe Biden puts our citizens last, I will put you first. You will be first, and America will be first, and we're going to do things that nobody ever thought possible. Our country right now is being destroyed by people coming in that nobody has any idea where they come from. Think of it. They're coming in from prisons and jails. They're coming in from mental institutions. An insane asylum, that's a mental institution on steroids, okay? They're coming in at a level that nobody's ever seen before. These guys have — it's the biggest thing. It's the, it's the biggest — so when I ran in 2016, it was such a big thing, the border. That was peanuts compared to what we're talking about now. And I tell the story. I did such a good job on the border. Remember? They're coming in. They're racist. They're this. They're that. Uh, and they said rapists, too. Rape. I called them everything. It's peanuts compared to what this turned out to be. And that was less, those words were very inflammatory at the time. About three months later, they realized that the words were correct, except they weren't strong enough. It was actually the opposite. But we took this and we, we did a job with it. And then they couldn't, they wouldn't talk about it anymore. They didn't want to talk about it. But we, we're talking about it now because this makes what happened in 2016 it just pales by comparison. There's never been anything like this. This is an invasion of the United States of America. And they're taking your jobs, and they're taking Hispanic jobs, and they're taking union jobs. 
how about the unions? The unions, they work long and hard to get their wages up, and they have wages now, and people are going to be working for 15 percent and 20 percent of what people are getting now. And we don't want that. We don't want that. In some ways, it's good for an employer, but it's really bad for our people, and it's very unfair for our people. And we don't want that. We want people to come into our country, but we want them to come in legally through a process. And it is true. A lot of unions are looking and they're saying, what are we going to do? Because, you know, you're driving a truck and they do a great job, but you're driving a truck and somebody comes along and he's willing to do it for a tiny fraction of the cost. And those people are out of jobs. The unions are going to be in big trouble. And Biden's the one that's allowing him in. You know, he gave two and a half million work permits this year to people that are illegal immigrants. Two and a half million work permits. And those are, and those are people. And the bigger problem is, and you know, at the, uh, at Georgia, in Georgia, the University of Georgia, they had a horrible killing. I said there's a new category of crime. It's called migrant crime. It's coming in at a level that nobody's ever seen before, and it's vicious. I call it Biden migrant crime, but it doesn't sound as good. In all fairness, my, it does. It's too long. It's migrant crime. But just remember, he's the one that allowed this to happen by stupidity. Well, Biden wants to raise your taxes by $6 trillion. I will make the Trump tax cuts the largest tax cut in history. We'll make it permanent and give you the new economic boom. It's going to be an economic boom. When I was president, we slashed taxes for working families. We doubled the child tax credit, which, frankly, wasn't a Republican thing to do. But I said, we have to do it. I do things that aren't necessarily Republican, you know. I do what's right, and I do things based on common sense. Somebody said, you're a conservative. I've said, no, I'm, I'm really a person of great common sense. We need borders. We need a strong military. We need good education. We need low interest rates. We want to be able to buy a house. It's really based more on common sense, I think, than anything else. Who could allow what's happening? This is an invasion. Have you seen New York where hundreds of thousands of people are living on streets, are taking parks that the kids can no longer play. They're going into schools and taking schools. They don't speak a word of English, and they're sitting down in classrooms. Nobody knows what to do. It's a disaster that's happening, and that's happening all over the country. As we supported moms and dads by dramatically expanding education savings accounts, I don't know if you've taken advantage of it, but it's a phenomenal thing. Under my leadership, the Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving, healthy American families. And something that's very big in the news today through Alabama, you saw that decision. We want to make it easier for mothers and fathers to have babies, not harder for them to have babies. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. You saw what happened. It's become sort of a big story. I put out a statement, and so many politicians are calling me, thank you for that statement. I put it out on a thing called Truth Social. It's the hottest platform. It's also where I speak. It's, uh, it's hot, and it's, uh, it's truth. Everyone said, you'll never get the name Truth. I said, let's try it. Sir, don't bother. You're not going to. They wanted something with five letters, like tweet. I don't know. Is it a tweet anymore? I don't think so. You know, it's X. So what do you do? Say, you're going to tweet? I don't know. They changed the name. I was sort of happy about that. But think of it. They said you, they had all these different names, these crazy names that nobody understood. And, you know, like uh, Zion, Zionening, Dodong, Dadang. <laughs> five letters. I said, ideally five letters. Like tweet is five letters. I said, uh, what about the word truth? Sir, you can't get that. There's no way you can ever buy that. That's uh, generic, and it's just that you're not going to be able to get it, I'm sure. So I said, well, have you checked? No, but I know you can't get it, sir. You know, these are wise guys. These are guys, you pay them a lot of money. They, they don't know what the hell they're doing. I said, do me a favor. I'm sure you can't get it. Try. <laughs> Try. So uh guy walks back into my office. 45 minutes later, he said, sir, you were right. We just bought the name Truth for $2,100. I would have paid millions. I would have paid millions. A guy had it. He said, man, I, and he probably got it for nothing and, you know, a long time ago. And he's happy. He's a very happy man. You know, he walked away with a couple of thousand bucks for doing nothing, having a name tied up. 
and we have the name and truth was born. That was a good, that's a good experience. But it just does tell you, always give it a shot. Never give up. If I wouldn't have said that, would have some name that nobody knows, has any idea what it means. Like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious, beautiful little baby. They need, some people need help, right? You agree? If Wesley didn't agree, I'd probably have to take that back. But he agrees, because again, that's common sense. We want to help people. We want to help women. They need help in some cases. Today, I'm calling on the Alabama legislature to act quickly to find an immediate solution to preserve the availability of IVF in Alabama. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers, fathers, and their beautiful babies. And IVF is an important part of that. And our great Republican Party will always be with you in your quest for the ultimate joy in life, and that's to have a baby. So if we can help, we're going to help. Right? We do with that. A lot of politicians were very happy because they didn't know how to respond to the decision that came down. Now they all know how to respond. I got so many thank you notes from big politicians. They said, thank you, sir because they didn't like what was, uh, what was happening, and now everybody's happy, and I believe that's exactly where it's going to be going. I, but they needed that little, well, maybe it's called leadership. I don't know what you'd call it. Maybe it's called just being intelligent. But that's what we want. We want to help the mothers. We want to help uh, people that want to have a baby that maybe otherwise would not be able to. I will stop the Biden inflation disaster, and we will, if you don't mind, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> Watch energy come way down. You know, the inflation was caused, I would say, would you say 100 percent, Byron, or 99 percent by energy, right? He says 90. Yeah. It was just caused by energy. These guys came out. They stopped the drill. They stopped everything. Now they're going back to the drilling. Now they're going back to the Trump drilling because the election's coming up. But the day after that, if they should win, because if they win, the country is destroyed. I don't think our country will survive if they win this election. I think it's the most important election. I used to say it about 2016, and I meant it. But 2016 was nothing compared to what we're going through right now. We're laughed at all over the world. People think we're — they can't believe it. We're — like, we've become a joke. We've become a joke. We're being laughed at. We have no — they don't respect our leader. How can you respect a guy? He can't put two sentences together. See this stage? We have three, four, four, five steps. We have all over the place. You have stairs. He can't find his way off a stage. <laughs> Secret Service has to run up to the stage. He'll walk off the front. He has no idea where the hell he is. And he's negotiating with — he's negotiating with President — President Xi of China. So tough. There's nobody in Hollywood that could play his role. President Xi. You meet him, he goes, we must begin negotiation immediately. I said, let's talk. Can you chill out a little bit? Do you ever go to a ball game? <laughs> no, it's the first time I met him. I, he and I were great until COVID, and then I sort of, like, said that's, that was just too much. But we had a great relationship, and uh, first time I met him, hello, how are you? We must begin negotiation. And he said, sure. <laughs> I like that, too. Actually, I respect it. You want to know the truth. In other words, he wants no bullshit. There's something that's okay. We don't, we don't have to talk about the weather. It's a wonderful day. Isn't it beautiful? How'd the Yankees do last night? Who cares? I will also pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. That is, if China or any other country makes us pay a 100 or $200 percent tariff or tax, we will make them pay a reciprocal tariff or tax of 100 or 200 percent right back. And basically, it's saying — and we don't have too many children in the room, and I'm sure most of them wouldn't be too offended by this — it's basically saying, you screw us, and we're going to screw you back. That's all it's doing. We're saying if they charge us a tax, they charge us — if we build a car, if we send it to China, they have a massive tax. So therefore, it never gets sent. You don't have — you don't have American cars in China. 
And you don't have too many China cars here. You know why? Because I put a big tax, 27.5 percent, any car made in China. And therefore, our automobile companies are doing better. But you have other companies, you have other countries that are really playing that game very big. One of them is Mexico. A uh, deal was made. You know, they've taken 30 percent of our car business over the last 25 years. That's a lot. 32 percent, to be exact. And they moved it to Mexico. And I was thinking seriously about putting a big tax that any car, any car made across the border, on the wrong side of the border, on the Mexico side of the border, I'm going to put a big tariff on the car, like 30, 40, 50 percent. The car no longer has any viability. I'll say, come on over and hire our people and build your plant in the United States, and you won't have any tax to pay, right? And we did a lot of that. We did it with different industries, and we did really well. This will bring back millions of great-paying manufacturing jobs and raise wages for workers of all backgrounds. The next pillar of our effort to earn the votes of African Americans will be an ironclad pledge to seal the border, stop the invasion, and send Joe Biden's illegal aliens back home. We have to do this. We have to do this. Have to do it. No country can, can sustain 18 million people, whatever it's — you can't sustain this. When, when you go to these cities and they're living in the middle of your best streets, they're living on people's lawns, they throw a tent or they just lie down. It's such a sad thing. I mean, on a human basis, it's tragic. They should have never let this happen. But there's no — no country can sustain this. And don't forget, Generally speaking, they don't send their finest. I got to know most of the leaders, like in South America. They come from all over the world. But you think of South America, but they come from all over. But I got to know them. They're very cunning people. They're street smart people. Our guy's not street smart. Our guy doesn't have it. You know? <laughs> what are you going to do? Remember I said that of uh, Chris Christie? You, you're not allowed to use the word fat. You know that. You're not allowed to call some, <laughs> you're not allowed to call somebody fat. It's politically incorrect, okay? So I was with, you know, this guy has Trump derangement syndrome like nobody. How's he doing lately, by the way? Uh, he's, he's got Trump derangement syndrome at, I would say, a terminal level. And some guy, some guy shouts out in the audience, he's a fat pig, but nobody heard him. He was very quiet. Right? Nobody heard him. He was in the front row. He said, sir, he's a fat pig. And I said, okay, listen, you, stand up, please. The guy stands up, big, strong guy. I said, you cannot call Chris Christie a fat pig. You, just don't do that. You can call him a pig, but not a fat pig. You're not allowed to use. So never, please, I'll, I'm going to have to have you removed from this room. You cannot call him a fat pig. I said that about 12 times to the guy during the night. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, but it's one of those things. Well, he just did. He just said something that was sort of cool back there, but we won't repeat it. No one is a — really is hit harder than uh, the people in this room, the black workers, the Hispanic workers, people that have good jobs. They're going to be decimated. Everything is going to be changed. The world is going to be changed because of all these people pouring into our country. And you have to understand, though, the leaders of these countries, they are street smart. They're not sending their hard-working good — you know, they're sending people. That's why they're sending them out of their prisons. Prisons in various countries that you know very well are empty. They used to be full. Remember the pictures two years ago where they're so crowded? Oh, it, it was hell. But these are rough guys, too. These are rough, rough, tough guys. Uh, you look at MS-13, probably the roughest gang in the world. I mean, they cut people up for fun. They don't like using guns because it's not painful enough. These — remember, they attacked the two girls on Long Island going to school, and they cut them up into little pieces? And these people are coming into our country. They're — they're nasty and tough and horrible. But those countries keep their people the people that they want. They send us the people that they don't want. That oh, — that is not just people from prisons. That is not just people from mental institutions and terrorists. It's other people also. Uh, they are trying to keep the people that have made their country, whatever it may be, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Their wages will be cut in half. Your wages will be cut. 
the black worker, their wages are going to be cut in half, but much more, I believe, much more than that. And ultimately, their jobs are going to be gone. They're going to be given to other people. It's a bigger problem than anybody understands. Just like I was saying a year ago, you know, I don't want to be bragging, but there was a hat that was made about two years ago. It said Trump was right about everything, and it was a big — I was right about everything, I'm telling you. <laughs> I was right about everything. And — What's happening now is, is something — I said, if you allow these massive numbers of illegals in, you're going to have a crime wave, the likes of which has never been seen. It's now starting. I'm surprised it took as long as it took. But you're having a crime wave now, a different crime wave. But you're having a crime wave, the likes of what has never been seen before in this country. I just can't believe it took a couple of years. I guess they were getting comfortable in the country, and then they said, all right, now it's okay to start beating up policemen. But uh, the crime wave is really big. It's migrant crime. It's really big. It's a terrible thing. And you add that to the crime that was already very high. Uh, this administration has been a disaster. Joe Biden has already given work permits, as I said, for 2.5 million illegal aliens to complete the total betrayal of black Americans. It's a betrayal. You're not going to be able to get jobs. We got all these people, and they'll work for practically free. And, you know, it's just — you're going to lose your jobs. And meanwhile, migrants are being dumped in predominantly black communities. You know that. Look at what's happening in Chicago. I watched women, specifically some incredible women. They're like mothers. They're people. They love their neighborhood. They're — you know, they have pictures and names of their neighborhood. They're saying, we don't know what to do. These people are coming in. We don't know what to do. And the city is giving all of the money to them. They're not giving any money to anybody else. They're giving hotel rooms. They're staying in luxury hotels. And our veterans are blacks and our Hispanics and our Asians are living on the streets with nothing. It's crazy. It's crazy. He's flooding our towns with foreign gangs and deadly drugs. Drugs are pouring into our country. But these women, I don't know, and for some reason it seems to be in Chicago, in particular, the way they, they have a group. It's just wonderful, beautiful black women that are saying, what are you doing to us? You're destroying our way of life. That's going to be that way all over the country. It's going to be that way all over the country. On day one, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, and we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. We will also act to swiftly crush the wave of violent crime. And, you know, uh, these people come from some pretty tough countries, and I said it before. They couldn't do what they do here, you know. You saw the middle finger going out to our police the other day. If that happened in their country, they'd be — they'd be dead within two minutes. They'd be dead. Uh, they took them a little while to realize that we're politically correct — or politically wrong, in my opinion. But uh, it took them a little while. But if they went in — you go into some of these South American countries where they have the guys with the bullets across the — you know, Pancho Villa, right? Boom, boom. They got more bullets. You got to be strong just to carry the ammunition. And I got 28,000 of them to protect our border. Don't forget, I told Mexico, you have to give us 28,000 soldiers. The president of Mexico laughed at me. He said, why would we do that? What are you crazy? We're not going to give you. I said, yes, you 100 percent. No, 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 we won't. We won't. You know that story. Did anybody hear that story? We won't. We won't. And I said, no, no, you will. You have to give us 28,000 soldiers. We're building the wall. We built 571 miles of wall. We're going to do another 200 miles of wall. We had it built, and then when Biden came in, all you had to do was going to take three weeks. It would have been erected 200 extra miles, far more than I said during the campaign that I was going to build. But I said to Mexico, you have to give us soldiers because they're coming through your country in numbers that nobody's ever seen. And the president said, no. I said, listen, you're my friend. I like the guy. I said, you're my friend. Send somebody to negotiate with me. So they sent this gentleman over, a very handsome guy, tall, beautiful-looking guy. And I said, uh, I want 28,000 soldiers guarding our border, and I'm not going to pay. And they said, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to do that. We had a woman from the State Department who was a very nice woman. She worked on Mexico exclusively for 25 years. I said, give me the top 10 things that you want. I'll get all 10 of them. 
They said, uh, she said, sir, you're not, you're wasting your time. We've been after this for 20 years. Like catch and release in Mexico, like remain in Mexico, like your title where you have sick people not allowed into our country because they will, they will give disease to other people that would never have happened. You have a lot of very sick people and we all have a heart. We want to take care of the people. We can't have them come into our country and infect our country. And all of these things, I had 10 things. I went to Tom Homan, who you know, he's a tough guy. I went to a couple of other, Brandon Judd, great people. And they're very strong. Our border was the strongest it ever was. I said to him, no, no, you're going to give it to me. No, he said, I'm not going to give you 28,000 soldiers. I'm not authorized to do that. I said, I promise you, you're going to give it. Now, you're going to give us 28,000 soldiers, and we're not going to pay for them. And they're going to go from east to west, or west to east. I'll take it either way. And you're going to give us 28,000. No, no, no. He says, no way. I said, way, way. And he said, no. And then I said to him, here's the story. You're going to give us the 28,000 soldiers. We're not going to pay. And if you're not, we're going to put a 25 percent tariff on every car that you have made that you stole out of America. We're going to give you a 25 percent tariff. Every single car and every product that's made in Mexico that comes into the United States is going to have a 25 percent tariff placed on it. And if you're not going to give us the soldiers, it goes into effect on Monday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was a Friday. And he said, uh, sir, you know, you ever see a guy choke like over a putt or over a pitch by a guy that throws a ball at 100 miles? It's like, oh. And uh, you could see he was a little choky. He was getting a little bit choky. May I have five minutes, I said, to call the president of Mexico? Yes, sir, to call the — he comes back in in about three minutes. He goes, we would be delighted to provide you with 28,000. And we had, that's why we had the lowest numbers, the best numbers in the history of the border, the history of our country by far. We also did two other things. Drugs were down 57%. Now, drugs are 10 times higher than at any time. The drugs are pouring into our country. There's nobody to stop them. It's not just people. And human trafficking, and it's almost always with women. It's women. And you think of it almost as an ancient crime. You know, when you hear human traffic, you don't think about it as today in this world. Well, it's worse today than it was a thousand years ago. And the reason is because of the computer, because of the internet. They search the internet for women and they grab them. It's an unbelievable, horrible thing. And it's big business. It's getting to be as big as the drug business. And we're going to stop these people. We're not going to do it. We did a better job on that than anybody's ever done. We had it because it was very hard to get them in. They'd have women put in trunks of cars. It was vicious, vicious. And we had it largely. We had a big portion of it stopped. I mean, these are violent people, very smart, but violent, violent, streetwise people. And we had so much stopped, and we did such a good thing. And then when he took over, he let it all expire. The person from the White House, from the uh, Secretary of State's office, from State Department, she couldn't believe it. She said, you got every one of the 10 things we've been trying for 25 years. You got every — I said, I told you. I got every single one. I got things remain in Mexico. That was a big thing. When you come up, if you want to come through Mexico, that's okay. But you're going to remain in Mexico until you're approved to come in, of which a very small portion got approved, like about 4%. But you are going to remain in Mexico. You had to see Tijuana. You had to see some. They, they became like one of the biggest cities. It was a mess. I said, they can't come into our country. We did such a good job. If Joe Biden, you know, somebody told him he looks great in a bathing suit. Now, he's 81 years old. And I don't know. I'm not sure that Cary Grant, do you know Cary Grant? He was this very handsome guy. I'm going to put it more in this. Sidney Poitier, I thought he was very handsome, right? When he was 81, I'm not sure he looked great in a bathing suit. I don't know if anybody looks too great in a bathing suit at 81. What do you think? Maybe these guys look good in a bathing suit. But if he would have, he was told by his genius political consultant, some genius that probably gets a million dollars a day, sir, you look great in a bathing suit. Go to the beach. Remember, he couldn't lift the chair. You know what the chair weighs? Like about three ounces. It's made of aluminum. <laughs> It's meant for child, children, young children that are four years old to be able to lift them for their grandfather. <laughs> Remember, he, he gets the chair. Oh, 
and that he can't lift his feet out of the sand. And somebody was saying that uh, this is a good look. It's not a good look. And it's also not a good look to be in on a beach on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday. You know, maybe Saturday and Sunday, Ben. But, you know, when you got a guy that can't get his feet out of the sand, he's falling over. He can't lift the chair. And uh, it was a pathetic sight, actually. And all he had to do, but if he went to the beach and left the border alone, just left it alone, he would have the greatest border that we've ever had. But because I did it, they dismantled everything. They dismantled stay in Mexico. Think of it. Remain in Mexico was such a big thing. It was a big deal. To get that from Mexico, by the way, Mr. President, I want you to uh, have everybody remain in your country. Do you think that's easy to say to a guy? That's why they laughed at me. When I first went there, I said, yeah, we want remain in Mexico. We want this. We want that. But the big thing, 28,000. We want 28,000 soldiers. And they laughed at me. They said, this guy must be stupid. This, how could he ask for something so ridiculous? Within 10 minutes, they were agreeing to everything, you know? You got to have the people that know how to sell. And if they don't know how to sell, you got the wrong people. She worked 25 years. She was a good woman, by the way. But she worked 25 years. She got nothing. I worked 10 minutes. I got the whole damn thing. You take... I'll give you another example. I'll give you another example. In France, the leader, Macron, right? You know that, right? So I was told, I was told, and they're very, you know, they're very difficult, actually. And uh, I was told very strongly that they're going to put a big tax on our companies doing business in France. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. And they were going to put a massive 25% tax on American companies doing business in France. Why? You know, we don't want that. Why is that? We don't do it to them. So I called up my Treasury Department. I said, go and negotiate and tell them if they put the tax on. We're not going to be happy. They did. They came back a week later. They said, they won't do anything. Sir, it's been passed by the legislature. So I, don't, I said, I don't care if it was passed by 10 legislatures. Tell them we're not going to take it. I said, you got two more days. Come back. They came back. They didn't bring the turkey. So I said, watch. Watch a grown-up do it. These are all geniuses. They're all smart guys. Spectacles, nice spectacles, you know, brilliant guys, all brilliant. They can't do crap. So what I did, I called up. I said, get me Emmanuel Macron, please. Emmanuel, how are you? Oh, Donald, Donald, I miss you so much. We must have dinner. I said, yeah, but first we have to settle a problem. Look, you have a, you've instituted a big tax on American companies, 25%. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, we have done that. Oh, and, uh, yes, it's been fully approved. Thank you very much. It's already in effect. As it is a story, Emmanuel, take it off. Well, I won't be able to do that. This was approved by the legislature. That's okay. You are the legislature. Here's what you do. Take it off fast. Because if you don't take it off, I'm going to put a 100% frickin' tariff on every bottle of wine and every bottle of champagne that comes into the United States from France. No, 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 Donald. You cannot do that. That would be very unfair. I said, no, unfair is what you're doing to American Cup. Within about three minutes, he said, may I get back to you? I said, yes, but you got to do it fast because it's ready to be instituted. I have it in front of me right now. I'm going to sign it. He calls me back in about three minutes. Donald, we have decided to remove the tax. We will not be charging American companies. And that was the end of that. Is that good? Is that a good story? I mean, you know, these are stories. I could give you more of those crazy stories. I got so many of those. I, would, I kept you out of war with that same kind of stuff. You didn't have any wars. We defeated ISIS. We killed Soleimani. We killed al-Baghdadi. We knocked the hell out of ISIS. Don't forget, ISIS, I was told by our generals, the television generals, we have great generals, by the way. Great. We have a great military, but not the guys that are on television. Not, not Millie. He says, you beat me. He actually beat me. Too. Not Millie. Not others, I won't say, but, they, you know, you get to know them after a while. But we have great warriors in there. Uh, Raisin Kane, right? What's your name, sir? My name is Kane. What's your first name? Raisin, sir. I said, wait a minute. Your name is Raisin Kane. Yes, sir. That's what they call me. Ra I love you, General. I've been looking for you for a long time. And he beat the crap out of them. He, what he did was unbelievable. He knocked them out in six weeks. I was told it was going to take four years. I met him. I flew to Iraq. And I actually met, I landed in Air Force One, had to turn off all the lights. After 20 years, you still couldn't have the lights of a plane on. We landed on the runway. Maybe you heard the story, told it a couple of times. We landed on the runway, sir. They said, 
Sir, we're getting ready to land. We're about an hour out. Uh, could you please have all the lights turned off in your cabin? I said, why? Because we don't want anybody to see us. So we spend a trillion dollars and we have to turn the lights off because we're going to be shot down. <laughs> Think of it, how crazy. I said, can you imagine? I'm spending and I'm, they're pulling down the shades and turning off. Not only pulling down the shades, pulling down the shades. And so the plane is totally dark inside, no lights on the wings, nothing, everything's out. And they're flying. And so what I did is I went up and I said, uh, I want to see the captain. I want to fly in with him because I love doing that. I love this great equipment. Although the plane's 32 years old, I ordered new ones and I saved $1.7 billion from what Obama was willing to pay. I have to tell you, black president, but I got $1.7 billion less. <laughs> Would you rather have the black president or the white president who got 1.7 billion off the price? I think they want the white guy right now. He got 1.7 billion off the price. I said, no, no, no. I said, we're not doing it. No, no, no. I kept saying no to Boeing and the price kept coming down for the exact same plane. Anyway, so I went up to the cabin and the captain's there. This captain. Better looking than Tom Cruise. I was going to say and taller, but I don't want to say that because I got myself in trouble. A perfect looking, like a male model, everything perfect. You know, they put the best people flying the president, which probably makes sense, the helicopters and the planes. Yes, sir, it's a great honor to have you in the cabin with us, sir. They had four guys that looked like the most handsome human beings I've ever seen. He said, sir, we'll be landing in 20 minutes, sir. And I, I don't know if anybody has ever been in a cabin of a very sophisticated commercial plane, one of the great planes, and uh, you, it's all computer uh, operated, the sounds and everything. They have a voice. And when you get 100 feet or 1,000 feet, it says 1,000. And it's a computer voice, but it's, you wish you could speak that way. So it goes <laughs> 1,000. And I'm having a problem because I don't see any lights and he's telling me we're about ready to land and I'm looking out for, and I've seen, I've been in a lot of planes. I love, you know, the whole feel of sitting up front. It's like you're in a bird and I'm watching. And I have these guys there, they're perfect. They're cool as cucumbers, the two captains. I've never seen so many people in a plane. They're five telephone operators. They say, how many calls can I make? You know, but they have guys, if I want to call China, sir, I take care of China. I take care of, it, it just, this is, uh, Serious. This is like the real deal. So anyway, so I'm walking up. I say, Captain, are we okay? Uh, <clears throat> talk about choking. I'm going, <clears throat> are we okay, Captain? Is everything all right? <clears throat> I don't see any lights up there, Captain. Uh, he goes, sir, we're fine, sir. And then you hear 1,000. That means we're 1,000 feet over there. That's not much. That's like, that's like a building. And this plane's very big. And there is absolutely nothing on the ground, and there's nothing in the plane. It's totally dark, other than a little tiny light up front so they can see a little bit. And I said, uh, Captain, okay, you sure everything's okay? Would you like to go back? Let's go back to America. He said, forget, I want to go to Iraq to find out why the hell we couldn't beat ISIS. And I did this. So we left at 3 o'clock in the morning from the White House. Everything was very top secret. Nobody knew I was going. It was a big surprise when I ended up there. In fact, they said they think Trump's on vacation. No, that's Biden that's on vacation all the time. <laughs> I, I took more vacations than any human being in history, I think. He set the record in history, not just for a president. He's on vacation right now. Whenever there's a problem, he's in one of his many homes. I figure that one out. He made 179000 was his top salary. He's got homes all over the place. So we're in there. It says 1900 800, 700, 600. That means 600 feet. That's very close to earth. <laughs> and underneath is desert. Not a light. 500. Captain, are we okay? Is everything... You know, <laughs> is everything okay, Captain? Yes, sir. No problem, sir. We'll be landing in 30 seconds, sir. 400. 300, 200. Ay, ay, ay. Oh. So now we're like 200 feet off the ground. This massive airplane, the wheels are down. 100. There's not a light in the runway. You know the way runways are all lit up, right? We know it. They're all lit up like, like flash bulbs. There's not a light in the runway. And then boom, boom. We land so beautifully, like perfect. And... 
I said to the captain, thank you, captain. I'm walking out of there. Man. <laughs> then I went. I said, great job, captain. Yes, sir. That was a great honor to have you, sir. Great honor, sir. And I'm walking out like, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> so it is all fact. So now I'm in Iraq, and I'm, uh, I'm going down, and I see my people, and I say, let me ask you a question. Does the President of the United States have the right to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor? Because, <laughs> because I feel I was extremely brave in sitting in that cabinet. They said, sir, we don't think that's a good idea. I said, okay. See, now I'll show you how dishonest the press is. If that's press back there. Here's the headline tomorrow. Donald Trump wanted to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor. So, right? They'll say, that's why you can never be sort of cute and jokey. And You know, when I imitate Biden, because he can't find his way off the stage, as you all know, he makes a speech that lasts usually about a minute and a half because the octane starts to wear off at a point. <laughs> You ever notice he starts off strong? Within about two minutes, he can't talk anymore. And then he walks off. You ever notice he always goes like this? <laughs> then he comes back up to the mic. And he's looking. He's totally lost. There's stairs all over the place. He can go there, there, here. He could jump off the front of the damn plot. But he goes... He always goes like this. And then, there's a stair right there, right? Then he starts. And then, and then Secret Service by the way, Secret Service, but they are, they're incredible people. So one of these beautiful, handsome, smart, intelligent, you know, with a far greater IQ than he had when he, when he was 45. They're much smarter than he was. You know, it's always lousy when Secret Service is smarter than the president, okay? So, but the Secret Service always runs up, grabs them, and leads them off the stage. And we say, this is our president, right? But here's the problem with that. Like I'll sometimes say, Barack Hussein Obama is the president of our country. And they'll say, Donald Trump didn't know who the president was. What I'm saying is, Obama's calling the shots, perhaps. <laughs> but when I say that, so it's very dangerous for me to do this. When I say, when I do the walk, my wife, I said, how did I do? Good, honey, but you couldn't find your way off the stage. What happens? I said, what the hell? They say that Donald Trump couldn't find his way off. They know it's not true. So I don't do too much imitation of that anymore. I don't do it. But since, do we have a good time? What the hell? Right? No, it's true. No, being, being sarcastic, I interchange names all the time. Every time I interchange a name, and I do it in sarcasm, Every time I interchange a name, they say, Donald Trump didn't know this one from that one. I know exactly what the hell I'm... Don't forget, I'm up here now rapping to you guys for 45 minutes without any notes because this stupid teleprompter wasn't working. So I could say, like Biden, he'd go like this. If the teleprompter... You know, sometimes, no matter how good the equipment, they don't work, right? So if Biden lost the teleprompter... First of all, he's no good with the teleprompter anyway, even when it does work. How about... When he takes questions from the press, he goes, here's notes. Because when I was in the White House, I remember I used to get these tremendous skirmishes. I'd scream, and I had that idiot from CNN. I had it all, and we won. We did win. I had a lot of fun. But think of this. Uh, uh, Jim from N NBC. And he's like, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Mr. President, uh, what's your favorite color of the ice cream and flavor of the ice cream? Uh, okay. Then he picks up a card and he reads the answer. My favorite color is black. But my favorite ice cream is vanilla. Yeah. So think of it. The press asks him questions. They ask him questions, 
And he reads the answers. That never happened to you. Did that ever happen to you? No, they, re they ream us, right, with questions. But it never happened with us. But since Biden took office, over 29 major cities have seen a 30 percent increase in murders or higher. They've never had a crime wave like this in the country. It's going to get much worse because of migrant crime. Last year, Washington, D.C. had the highest number of murders in 26 years. We have a capital where people are afraid to go there now. They're getting murdered. They go there from South Carolina. They go there from different places, and they come home in a box. No one has suffered more than black Americans from the pro-crime agenda of white liberals. Most of the violent crimes in these cities are committed by a small handful of dangerous repeat offenders, many of whom have been set loose by Marxist prosecutors. They don't want to go after them. And radical district attorneys who are too focused on locking up Republicans say they do. They really, I have more people after my ass than anybody. I think I don't think there's ever been a criminal. The worst criminal in history has not had the kind of attention that I've had. And that's weaponization. That's trying to inflict pain on your political opponent. We've never had that before in this country. You do have it a lot in third world nations, but we are becoming a third world nation. Like citizens of all backgrounds, black Americans want to live in safety. And that is what I will deliver as your president. You want safety more than anybody else. You want safety. You want to be able to go get a, a loaf of bread and not be shot. I will bring back the rule of law in America and your community will be safe. I promise you that as president. I gave our police officers the support and the resources to do their jobs and to do their jobs properly. We did a great job with that, and crime was way down. We also passed groundbreaking criminal justice reform. We wanted that. And nobody wanted it more than our great black citizens. They wanted it. They came to my office. We had uh, a tremendous guy named Van Jones. You know Van Jones? He works for CNN, so nobody watches. But he came to my office along with a few other people. He was brought in by my very brilliant son-in-law, Jared, who's probably liberal, but I don't want to talk about it. You? <laughs> a brilliant student from Harvard, probably liberal. But anyway, he says, Van Jones would like to see you and a couple of others. I said, uh, I'm not a big fan of Van Jones. He said, no, no, it's so good. It's criminal justice reform. Van Jones comes in. He said, sir, you're the only, we're five votes short. You're the only man that can get criminal justice reform done. We're five votes short, sir. We need to get some conservative senators. You think that's easy to get? No. And I said, so tell me about it. And he, he breaks down and he starts crying. And I thought it was a beautiful thing. I mean, it meant to me that he meant a lot. And he was crying like a baby in the office, saying, I, we need your help, sir. It's not going to happen. We were so close, but we're five votes short in the Senate. And I said, so tell me about criminal justice reform. And he said, it's something that the black community feels very, very strongly about. And I said, let me look into it. And he left. But the, the guy was, uh, he broke down, totally broke down in my office. And I called up some guys, and uh, one of them said, oh, you're calling about criminal justice. I don't want to do it, sir, but if you want it, I'll do it. I said, I really, I'd appreciate you, but I called up another one. And then, actually, we had a couple of conservative guys that actually wanted it, right? We had some conservative uh, senators and congresspeople, very conservative, some of the most conservative. Actually, had the, the biggest liberals and the biggest conservatives. But I called up a couple. But I had a really twist arms, as they say in the world of politics. And I got it done. Nobody else could have done it but me. <laughs> Obama tried. He couldn't do it. Bush tried. He couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I got it done. And it was a big deal, and everybody was happy. And they had a big celebration, and they had a news conference. And Van Jones was there with about 15 or 16 people. I called my wife, our great first lady, who says hello to you. She loves you, by the way. I called our great first lady. And I said, honey, I did something really good. Watch. Watch this, because the man is right there that I did it for. And uh, he broke down in my office. He really wanted it. It was very beautiful to watch. He wanted it really for the black population. It's a very important thing. You know, 
uh, you've been trying to get criminal justice reform for 60 years, where people are put, like some of our friends, they're given 50, 60-year jail terms for something that they should be given almost no jail term. And it's a, it was a serious problem. But I said, baby, watch this. It's going to be beautiful. He's going to say great things about me. I love that. Look, I don't care who you are. If you're watching television and somebody's on it, they say nice things about you, you tend to like them. <laughs> or you tend to at least want to watch. We can all be cool. I don't care. I, no, if you're... But I said, watch this, honey. It's really important. What we did is something really special. Nobody else could have done it but me. I'm the only one who could have done it. And so watch how nicely he'll recognize me. So he gets up, he goes, today we got criminal justice reform. I want to thank Reverend Al Sharpton. He had nothing to do with it. He, no he said, I want to thank Jim Jones. I want to thank Jim Smith. I want to thank Irving Schwartz. I want to thank this. I want to thank that. I want to thank this. He's reading a list. He never mentioned my name. And I say, Van Jones, someday I'm going to get you, Van Jones. <laughs> it's true. You know that? He never mentioned my name. My wife said, congratulations, darling. Great job you did. <laughs> ben, he never mentioned my name. And I thought that was terrible. And you can't do that stuff. You know, you can't play those games. Black conservatives understand better than most that some of the greatest evils in our nation's history have come from corrupt systems that try to target and subjugate others to deny them their freedom and to deny them their rights. You understand that. I think that's why the black people are so much on my side now, because they see what's happening to me happens to them. Does that make sense? I've heard that. When I did the mugshot in Atlanta, you know that mugshot is number one. Elvis Presley is Elvis Presley's number two, and Frank Sinatra's they they had Frank Sinatra for fighting, and they had Elvis for, I don't know, something in a gas station. He tried to hold up a gas station. I don't know. Something like Elvis. So Elvis is number two, but he was always number one. My, my, the mugshot, we've all seen the mugshot. And you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts, and they sell them for $19 a piece. It's pretty amazing. Millions. By the way, millions of these things have been sold. So I don't know if I'm proud of it or not proud of it. But anytime you can beat Elvis, that's okay, right? Over the past few years, millions of Republicans have woken up to the dangers of weaponized power in our government and our justice system. And no one knows about that better than me. When I return to the White House, I will have no higher priority than to restore fair, equal, and unbiased and impartial justice under the constitutional rule of law. That's for everybody in this room, everybody in this country. We share the dream of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He was great. What a speech. Where is she? Where's my beautiful? It is. Oh, I want to be able to see you. I wish they'd turn off those lights. I want, but you are so amazing, and we've been friends so long. But we share those dreams of a nation where we are all treated equally because we're all created equal, with equal rights and equal dignity in the eyes of God, and we love God. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great, great badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you, the American people. I'm being indicted for you, the black population. I am being indicted for a lot of different groups by sick people. These are sick, sick people. Never forget our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. It's very simple. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me, they're after you, and I'm just standing in their way. I just happen to be standing in their way from the very first day that we take back the White House. And it's going to be we are going to take back. It's not me. This is the greatest. Make America great again. When Biden gets up and says, we're going to stop. Make America great. I say, the guy doesn't even know what the hell it meant. If I said, Joe, what does MAGA mean? I don't know. Please tell me. I'd love to know. Make America great again. But right from the beginning, we take away our beautiful, cherished White House from crooked Joe Biden. I believe we're going to have the 
four greatest years in the history of our country and the four greatest years for the black population. It will inure to your benefit, just as it did in my first four years. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after we win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled and restore peace through strength. Just like when I did the wine and just like I did with the soldiers, we will have peace. We will have peace. We're not going to let that go on. People are being brutally killed by the hundreds of thousands. The numbers are far greater than they report. We're going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope and safety and beauty better than they have ever been before. We'll work with Democrat mayors and Democrat governors if we have to, but we're all controlled by the Democrats. But we will go in and we will straighten our cities out and we'll get rid of the crime. We will take over the horribly run capital of our nation in Washington, D.C., and clean up, renovate, and rebuild our capital city so it is no longer a nightmare of murder and crime, but rather it will become the most beautiful capital anywhere in the world. We will clean it up and we will make it safe and we will fix the roads, which have potholes and filth and garbage and the medians which have fallen into the roads. And I just wonder what foreign countries, what leaders of foreign countries think as they come into the Washington, D.C., and they see the deplorable graffiti all over the beautiful white marble columns. I will always defend Medicare and Social Security, which, as you know, Nikki is not doing a good job on that. You know, we sort of don't even talk about her anymore. It's amazing when you do badly in the polls how you don't mention people, isn't it? It's an amazing phenomena. I hope you <laughs> neocon. I hope I hope you remember that tomorrow, but I will support our because we have to get out our vote. We have to send the signal for November. We have to get out and vote. We have to win by big margins in Iowa. As I said, I got the largest margin in history by double. And New Hampshire, the same thing. We have the most votes in history. More than John F. Kennedy. Think of it. He's right next door. We got many more, thousands and thousands of votes more than John F. Kennedy. That's a great honor. I will support our community churches, and we will put faith and family at the center of American life. And that's a huge thing for the black community. I will fight for universal school choice so that every parent has the power to send their child to the private public, charter, or religious school that is best for their child. I will get politics out of our classroom and focus our schools on the skills of our children. We want them to be able to graduate from school and succeed and get a great, great job. There are jobs that they're well suited to, but they don't teach that in those particular schools. I think that vocational schools are really lacking in this country. You have people and they can make more money they can make more money that way than they're going to make by sitting in some cubicle doing numbers which they might not be good at but they may be really great at the other kinds of skills and I will keep men out of women's sports if that's okay with you I will fully uphold the second amendment and unlike democrats I will not disarm law abiding citizens while leaving guns in the hands of violent criminals we will protect innocent life and restore free speech, and I will secure our elections like never before. Our goal will be one day voting with paper ballots and voter ID, right? Voter ID. Paper ballots. You know, it'll cost about 9%. I don't know if you know that. Uh, with all the millions and millions they spend, and it's still really messed up, it will cost to have great, secure elections, 9% the cost of doing it the way we're doing it now. It's a scam. But until then, Republicans have to win. We just have to win. If you took the 10 worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done near the destruction and harm to our country as Joe Biden and the Biden administration has done. He's the worst president in history. And I, I'm telling you, and I told you before, I would never be this harsh I'd say, well, he's got some difficulty now. Once I got indicted, I said, wow, that's horrible. Nobody thought that was going to happen. Even the super liberal pundits said, well, they'd never indict a popular president. I get the most votes of any sitting president in history by far. So I guess that makes me popular. I watch some of these shows and they say, well, he's not popular. I said, I think I'm really popular. I have a 92% rating of the Republican Party. If I endorse somebody, it almost guarantees they're going to win. And I got to listen to these fake news people say, 
they usually tie me in with Biden. They usually say, these are two unpopular people. I don't think I'm unpopular, really. <laughs> then they say, women don't like him. I think women like me. I think I've, always, I've never had a problem. Never had a big problem. So if you want to save America, then South Carolina tomorrow, you must go out and vote. You have to do it. And in conclusion, every generation, black patriots in this state, this great state, I love this state, we've won it every time, primaries and general elections, and all across our nation have poured out their blood, sweat, and tears for our country. Black patriots fought and bled on the battlefields of the American Revolution, and they really did, when you read the history, what they gave up. They gave everything to smash the chains of slavery and preserve our nation, and they did it with incredible bravery. They helped win the Wild West, tame the skies, and save freedom in the Second World War. They're warriors. From the very beginning, black Americans have been a vital part of the American story, helping to make this the greatest nation in the history of the world. So true. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you for it. But now we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, its willpower, and its strength. We are a nation that has lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. We have to be. We have to be. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it is hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. We will fight for America like no one has ever fought before. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, black Americans. Again, nobody has ever seen poll numbers like this. If we could guarantee this for nine months, we could, do you see this? All my friends right here, you're going to be in that position that you're looking for in California, too. I predict, I predict you're doing great. But all of these incredible people, all of these people, they're so great. If we could come in just at the numbers we have now, there's no way we can be defeated. We have to come in. We have to win because we're going to lose our nation. We will demolish the deep state. We'll expel the warmongers, these stupid, crazy warmongers from our government. They want to go out and kill everybody. They don't understand. They want to kill everybody for no reason whatsoever. Countries that don't want us, countries that have people. They're dying all over the place. We're dropping bombs all over the Middle East again. Here we go with stupid people dropping bombs. We'll drive out the globalists. We'll cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We'll throw off the sick political class that hates our country. They absolutely hate our country. And we will evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House on November 5th, 2024. He's been very bad to you. He's been very, very bad to you. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten men and women will be forgotten no longer. They will be forgotten no longer. They weren't forgotten during that four-year period. It was a glorious period for our nation. Again, the best job numbers from every single group, women, men, people with beautiful, beautiful diplomas from MIT, Harvard, from the Wharton School of Finance, the greatest, people with no diploma from high school, every single group was doing better than they had ever done before. We're a movement, and it's a big movement. It's the biggest movement in the history of our country. Make America great again, MAGA. It's, it's, and, and you are going to be the biggest part of it. I believe you could be the biggest part of it. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America 
great again. Thank you very much, everybody. We love you all. God bless you all. God bless you. Thank you.